Hello everyone, you are very welcome to our information session on our LLM in International Human Rights and our LLM in International Migration and Refugee Law and Policy. My name is Lisa and I work in student recruitment for the School of Law. And today I am joined by two colleagues um, in the Irish Centre for Human Rights, Dr. Anna arstein Kirslake and Dr. Kira Smith. And the format of today's session is a short presentation. And once it's over, I will introduce you to a current student of ours, Emily Williams, and then also a recent graduate of ours, Elisa Bynon. Um, and then once we speak to those students, then at the very end, we'll allow you plenty of time to ask us any questions that you may have about the programme. So we'll begin now and I will pass you over to Dr. Kira Smith. Thanks, Lisa. So everybody's very welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to say a few words by way of introduction to the Irish Centre for Human Rights before I hand over to my colleague who'll talk specifically about the LLM in international human rights and then I'll come back and talk about the LLM in international migration and refugee law and policy. So just to say a few words about the Irish Centre for Human Rights, um, it's located in the campus in NUI Galway, it's part of the School of Law and it is I think widely regarded and justly regarded as the world's premier academic human rights institution. Um, so it's directed to the study and promotion of international human rights law, also regional human rights law and domestic human rights law. So it, it deals with that multi-level structure where you're dealing with the international level, the regional level and the local level. It also uh, looks at international criminal law, which is the area of international law that deals with international criminal responsibility, um, deals with crimes like genocide and crimes against humanity and torture and so on um, and also international humanitarian law or the laws of armed conflict which are the laws that apply um, whenever there is an international or a non-international armed conflict uh, in fact that's one of the oldest bodies of uh, public international law so the Irish Centre for Human Rights deals with all three broad areas international human rights law international criminal law and international humanitarian law So in terms of why you might be interested in studying at the Irish Centre for Human Rights um, and our, um, our two students, our uh, former student and our current student can speak a little bit more about this um, from their personal experience, but it is quite a dynamic place to, to do an LLM. Um, there's a lot going on in the Irish Centre for Human Rights. Um, and so we have a very busy programme of seminars, summer schools and conferences. Uh, and the example that's given there is the annual Galway Business and Human Rights Symposium. So uh, whereas previously human rights were mainly directed towards regulating the state, now we're quite interested also in how it regulates non-state actors and in particular big business and transnational corporations. Um, but we also, for example, have a summer school on the International Criminal Court every year. Last year, the summer school was in June. It's usually in June for a week. And uh, to the summer school, we bring lots of renowned international academics and also lawyer practitioners and judges from the International Criminal Court. And um, so that happens every year amongst other um, conferences and, and, and summer schools. Um, as you go through your program in the Irish Centre for Human Rights, uh, we like to, insofar as we can, offer career support and to talk about the types of roles that you might take up either by way of internships or by segueing directly into paid opportunities. Now, we don't offer internships ourselves and that would be beyond our scope, but um, we do rely on our network of alumni to, to help us introduce students to, to the possibilities that are out there. Um, we have lots of expert lecturers and guest speakers and so I was just looking up the many talks that we've just had this academic year and um, from September onwards. And I'll just get, name a couple just to give you a flavor of the type of guest speakers that we've had. Um, so in September, we had the United Nations Special Rapporteur on minority, right, minority issues, talking about minority languages. 
Um, we had a judge from the Kosovo Specialist Chambers talking about contemporary challenges in international criminal justice. We had a lieutenant colonel and legal officer in the Irish Defence Forces, so the Irish Army, talking about international humanitarian law and peace support operations. Um, we had a professor of law from the Centre for Human Rights in the University of Pretoria talking about the right uh, of access to safe abortion in Africa. Um, and recently we had a talk by Emily Logan, who is the commissioner, uh, chief commissioner on the Garda Shikona Ombudsman Commission, in other words, the police commissioner in Ireland. Uh, she was formerly uh, head of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. And prior to that, she was also the children's ombudsman. So she's lots of practical experience uh, in the implementation on the ground of human rights law. So they're just that's just a cross section of the many, many speakers, guest speakers that we've had either giving lunchtime seminars or seminars in the evening um, to students on a wide range of issues. So you can see that we bring these uh, people in from other countries and from Ireland, and they speak to both international, regional and domestic issues. Um, every year, there's a couple of field trips to the uh, institutions of interest, which could be um, the International uh, Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice in The Hague, um, or indeed the EU institutions, which now increasingly are involved in, uh, in uh, fundamental rights and human rights uh, work, uh, and also uh, to Strasbourg, to the um, location of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, we also are linked in with the Global Legal Action Network, known as GLAN, and I'll speak about them a little bit more at the moment. They're located in the Irish Centre for Human Rights. And we run an international human rights law clinic, and I'll address both of those uh, now. Okay, so um, one of the innovative modules that we offer uh, in the Irish Centre for Human Rights um, is the International Human Rights Law Clinic. This is offered, uh, at least in theory, to all students on all programmes. So today we're only speaking about two programmes, the, the Human Rights LLM and the International Migration and Refugee Law and Policy LLM. But actually all our LLMs, this Human Rights Clinic is, is made available. Um, now, there isn't a place for every student, but um, our past and former student can tell you it, the practicalities of how it works. So what is the International Human Rights Law Clinic? It's, it's a module that equips students with practical training uh, on mobilizing human rights standards to secure law reform or policy reform or practice reform on the ground at the domestic UN and regional levels. Um, so, uh, so basically, rather than working on an essay, for example, um, students will work on a tangible project, the outcome of which might be a publication in the form of, might look like an essay, but it will often lead to an actual publication. Um, and that publication can be used as an advocacy tool um, to try and change law or practice. So a couple of examples are this year, um, well, just last year, a number of students from a number of our different LLMs published really important secondary school teaching materials um, to help secondary school teachers educate our students in relation to the human rights violations suffered in Ireland's industrial schools, Magdalen laundries and mother and baby institutions where unmarried mothers would have been placed and treated very badly and subjected to a system of indentured servitude essentially uh, until quite recently in Irish history. Um, so those materials were developed by our students and made available and then uh, sort of road tested and um, they did a bit of capacity building with secondary school teachers also on how to use the materials. Um, then just to fast forward to the last one there, uh, um, one of a group of another group of students um, published, uh, well, first of all, researched uh, and published a report to the Minister of Children, uh, which analysed the impact on children's rights in Ireland of children living and growing up in the state-sponsored accommodation system for asylum seekers, which is known as direct provision. So they produced this report and, uh, and gave it to the minister um, with a view to changing the direct provision system um, in the interests of the fulfillment of the rights of the child. Um, but you can see there that there have been many really interesting other pieces of work done 
um, like recommending statutory time limits for decisions on international protection applications. So this is basically when people are awaiting an outcome of their of their refugee claim or their claim for international protection. And um, they can be in that system for a very long time. And a group of students researched, uh, did a piece of comparative research looking at other jurisdictions and made some recommendations about establishing a statutory limit for how long the process should take. Um, there was also a really interesting piece of work done a couple of years ago on establishing a legislative ban on importing fracked gas. So of course, we're very much involved in the burgeoning area of climate justice. Um, and that was an early uh, report that was produced by students uh, in that regard. I'll just say a quick word about the Global Legal Action Network, which is uh, an NGO, a nonprofit organization, um, that essentially is involved in strategic interest litigation. So what is strategic interest litigation? Strategic interest litigation is identifying a particular uh, issue that could usefully be changed through law reform, through reform in the courts, um, and, and then challenging a practice in a way that it will come before the court and hopefully the court will give a judgment that's favorable, uh, that goes in the direction of the change that you seek. So the Global Legal Action Network, they're set up to, to pursue strategic interest litigation on many, many diverse human rights issues, such as war and occupation. So they would do a lot regarding, for example, the Palestinian occupied territories, also the ongoing situation in Yemen, for example. Um, they look at environmental and economic justice issues. They're very involved in climate justice that I mentioned earlier. And um, they look at migration and border violence. Um, and issues that happen, for example, in the Mediterranean, where there might be a failure to rescue, a deliberate failure to rescue, or indeed where migrants are pushed back by European countries to transit countries like Libya, or indeed where the EU, for example, will pay Libya uh, to increase the capacity of their border guard to pull people back uh, to Libya after they tried to leave on, on ships or on boats for Europe. Um, so the Global Legal Action Network is involved across a range of different pressing issues and um, trying to use the law as a tool for change. Um, but they're not just involved in strategic interest litigation. They also work with communities, including local communities. They develop advocacy materials and um, they disseminate legal analyses of different issues with a view to helping other academics and practitioners take the issues forward. Um, so you can see some of the cases that the Irish Centre for Human Rights students have been involved with, things like case submissions to the European Court of Human Rights, very interesting um, case coming up before the European Court of Human Rights on pushbacks and pullbacks in the Mediterranean, uh, monitoring airstrikes in Yemen, um, forced labour in Europe, uh, and indeed importing, for example, cotton from countries outside Europe into Europe. Uh, where forced labour has been involved and indeed where that cotton is marketed as being environmentally friendly. Um, well, it might be environmentally friendly, but it isn't human rights friendly. Um, also, Indigenous people's rights in Western Sahara. And Western Sahara is, is, uh, is a very violent place, subject to ongoing tensions that have been ongoing for decades now and to the expense of Indigenous people who live there, their rights, uh, nomadic people who live there. Uh, and I've already mentioned the rights of migrants at sea. So GLAN is located within the Irish Centre for Human Rights, um, although its work is clearly international, and it offers placement opportunities um, to uh, students in the Irish Centre for Human Rights in the different programmes. Now, again, it's not something that all students um, will be able to avail of because um, the organisation needs to balance giving everybody a chance on the one hand, with their need for people to hit the ground running. And so they're really looking for people who already have a little bit of experience or a particular skill, like a language skill, for example. Um, but, but it's important to know that, that we do have those links with GLAN and that there are student opportunities available. Uh, so I'll hand you over to my colleague, Anna now, who will talk about uh, the LLM International Human Rights. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Kira. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction to the um, Irish Centre for Human Rights uh, as a whole. Um, uh, it, it 
is I really can't accentuate a, a unique um, and, and really exceptional place for um, students to come and not only learn about human rights law, but also to actually be a part of um, uh, practicing human rights law, um, which I think Kira did a really good job of, of explaining some of those opportunities for students to actually be practicing human rights law. Um, so uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today is the, um, the core um, LLM that we have at the center, which is the um, International um, Human Rights um, LLM. Um, so that's our largest LLM program. Um, and, and we do have, as Kara mentioned, and she'll, and she'll talk about in a moment, um, several um, more specific um, LLM programs. Um, one of them, of course, being in um, migration, which uh, Kira is going to talk about as well. Um, so the, the, the sort of um, flagship, if you will, um, uh, LLM, which is the International Human Rights LLM, um, uh, has a, a very a various number of students every year, but this year we have um, over 50, which is a great cohort of students. Um, and uh, essentially, it provides students with um, the, the foundation, the foundational knowledge in, in human rights law. Um, and it does it, it, we do that in a way that isn't just sort of, um, um, uh, you know, lecturing at you and giving you the information of what human rights law is. Um, it's a really dynamic process of um, of delivering knowledge to you on human rights law, um, but also building skills to critically analyze human rights law, to apply human rights law to different scenarios, um, and in various different ways, um, also to, to engage with external bodies um, in the clinic and in other ways, as, as Kira already mentioned. Um, it might be useful also for you to have a, a brief um, uh, understanding of my background. Um, I'm currently the program director of the LLM, um, although I'm uh, newly returned to NUI Galway. Um, I actually did my PhD and a research fellowship at NUI Galway from uh, 2011 to 2014. Um, so it was the beginning of my academic career. And, and then I um, uh, went on to Melbourne Law School where I was for seven years before returning just in September here to NUI Galway. Um, and uh, I, I was um, absolutely um, uh, so thankful for my time at NUI Galway as a postgraduate student. And, and I think that walking away from NUI Galway and, and working in another setting for many years, um, I really saw the advantages that, um, that NUI Galway gave me, especially in the area of human rights. And um, so my work is primarily focused on um, the right to legal personhood, uh, which, which means that um, I work in lots of different areas of law. So I work in, um, in, in human rights law in general. I also work in domestic criminal law. Um, I also work in, in civil law because I look at guardianship and, and things like that. Um, so I work in all these different areas and um, having done uh, my postgraduate work at NUIG, um, I had an amazing exposure to leaders in, in human rights in the field um, and also leaders, not just in the, in the general area of human rights, but in many different areas of, of um, um, specialized areas of human rights. Um, so disability, for example, um, the Irish Center for Human Rights, um, and it works collaboratively um, with the Center for Disability Law and Policy that which focuses on the human rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and that's just one example. Um, we also have a center on housing rights um, at the law school. So another group of people working on an area of human rights um, collaboratively um, and um, uh, with funding um, and, um, and on also engaging external bodies. Um, so um, I think that uh, hopefully that's an interesting overview of myself. Um, and um, I, think, uh, I think I'm gonna talk, I think I might turn now to the actual program and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, who I think um, would be interested in taking the LLM um, and doing the LLM. Um, 
in international human rights um, at the center at NUIG. Um, so the, um, and I think maybe we could just go to the next slide, slide there, Lisa. I think that the next slide might be, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so the LLM itself can be done in one year full-time or two years um, part-time. Um, and it really offers um, a um, exceptionally diverse range of subjects. Um, and um, I, I say that having um, uh, worked in other universities and um, uh, worked as a visiting scholar as well in many other universities. And, and I think this is the most diverse range of human rights modules of any university that I've worked at. Um, so as you can see, um, uh, there almost any area of interest that you have is covered by one of our subjects, um, international criminal law, international humanitarian law, peace operations, refugee law, Islam and human rights, um, gender and human rights, um, European migration law. Um, and in fact, we also have a, a process for developing additional modules, um, which is which is constantly sort of evolving. Um, so the, uh, the, the LLM in human rights law um, is perhaps on our, our largest cohort of students because it offers you a lot of flexibility in that the only core module um, is uh, international human rights law. Um, or the main core module is international human rights law. And um, apart from that, you get to select from many other um, um, modules. Um, so you can really um, walk away from the LLM uh, with a very um, sophisticated um, um, and varying range of knowledge in various different specialized areas in human rights. Um, and of course, there's also the um, uh, minor thesis that you'll complete, um, which is on a topic of your choosing um, and is supported, of course, by the academics in, in the center. Um, I think that um, is probably the core um, pieces of information yet to know um, regarding the actual uh, modules. Um, and just to note also that as Kira mentioned, um, one of those potential modules that you can take is um, the International Human Rights Clinic, um, which is run by uh, Maeve O'Rourke. And um, it, it, it allows the students to work directly with um, a, an external client who is doing, um, uh, or is in need of human rights work to be done. Um, or is a human rights body who, who has more work than they can do, um, and so uh, seeks uh, student assistance on particular areas. Uh, and Kira gave you some great examples of those projects. Um, so I'll just come now to um, who, um, in my view, would be interested in doing uh, uh, the LLM in International Human Rights at the Irish Center for Human Rights. Um, and, and then I'll talk a bit about where you might go beyond that um, after completing the LLM. So um, there's three, I think, um, key students that I would suggest doing um, the LLM in international human rights. Um, one is, is uh, or the first is simply students who are interested in human rights. Um, it, it's definitely that this is the program to be in. Um, in terms of allowing you to explore different areas of human rights. Um, and so that's just a sort of general interest. Um, the, the second group would be those interested in working in human rights. Um, and uh, the reason that I think that this LLM program that we have here at NUIG is um, particularly well suited for those that want to go uh, into the field um, and work in human rights is, is that um, we offer such a diverse range of subjects um, and diverse range of expertise from our faculty. Um, and also because we allow you the opportunity in many different um, ways uh, to engage with um, uh, um, potential employers really, um, but both um, potentially um, UN bodies, government bodies, domestic government bodies, and um, NGOs and community groups. So through the clinic, um, through the internship opportunities, um, and the work of the, um, the network that um, Kira mentioned as well. Um, uh, the third group is a gr group of students who are interested in um, scholarship. 
Um, and um, and that um, group, I think, is particularly well served here at NUIG um, because of the expertise of faculty. Um, so most of our faculty uh, have have uh, already extensive experience uh, supervising um, both both master's theses and um, PhD students, um, and there's a range of scholarship opportunities. Um, and many of our PhD students are um, students that first did the the master's program. Um, so it's a it's a great if if scholarship and academia is um, something you're interested in. Um, the um, I think any of our LLMs really are well suited, um, but the International Human Rights um, LLM really gives you that foundational knowledge to to then go on and um, and work on more specific research if that's what you're interested in. Um, and of course, also I should mention um, for all of those groups. Um, activism, um, if you're interested in human rights activism, um, of course, the, the LLM program will give you the base knowledge um, to go on and use human rights as a tool for activism. Um, I think the only other thing that I really wanted to cover is a bit more detail on um, careers um, and going on to work in the human rights field. Um, the the opportunities are are really um, um, endless in a way um, in terms of um, employers that might be looking for uh, an, a, a future employee that has um, a postgraduate degree in human rights. Um, so it could in include um, human rights uh, institutions such as the United Nations or the European Court of Human Rights, um, or of course the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or other regional bodies. Um, and it could also include um, domestic governments. Um, so I know many students in the um, Irish Center for Human Rights um, have gone on to work um, as civil servants or with domestic bodies who are um, interested in policy making and um, law creation um, that is human rights compliant um, or at least human rights friendly um, if we can't always be human rights compliant at the domestic level. Um, and of course, there's the option of um, NGOs and um, community groups. Um, so um, I myself actually started my career in human rights with Human Rights Watch um, out of the Brussels office. Um, and uh, worked also with the New York office. Um, and um, it, it's um, a, a, a wonderful opportunity to be engaged in a very high level um, um, human rights advocacy. Um, and, and those um, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and those kind of very large, <clears throat> excuse me, human rights NGOs um, would definitely be looking for um, postgraduate degrees in human rights um, and um, everyone that I know um, uh, there um, did have that experience um, and, and are um, and we of course engage with a lot of those um, NGOs in, in the clinical work we do and, um, and also actually I work with a lot of them so um, I often bring them on as um, guest lecturers and these kinds of things. Um, I think um, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, just, uh, yeah, Lisa, you can go ahead and go to that next slide there, um, is, is to just highlight uh, that this year um, we were um, very lucky that um, uh, and honored that um, Cassie Roddy uh, Milino, Milino um, is, uh, was awarded Law Student of the Year at the Irish Law Awards. Um, so she uh, was, uh, she's a former LLM student um, and um, she was part of the ICHR representative team at Ireland's United Nations um, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination Review. Um, she worked on the human rights clinic uh, that Kira, uh, Kira gave you uh, more um, in-depth information about a moment before. Um, and she also completed a legal research placement with the Global Legal Action Network. 
um, working on business related human rights abuses. So Cassie is actually a great example of a student that really took advantage of um, many of the different opportunities that we have um, within the LLM program and, and within the center more broadly. Um, thanks very much. I think those are the main highlights and I'll just pass over to Kira now um, to talk about the LLM in migration. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks Anna. Uh, and I'm just wondering if I can do another LLM in international human rights because I actually did my original LLM in international human rights law way back in the day when it, the Irish Centre for Human Rights didn't exist. I did it in Queen's University Belfast, but I loved it. And listening to that makes me want to do another one. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about the LLM in human rights law. I'm here to talk about the LLM in international migration uh, and refugee law and policy. Um, so this is a new-ish LLM in the sense that I think this is only our third year uh, running this LLM and in fact we're the only academic institution in Ireland um, to have an LLM of this type. There's only a handful in the UK, two I think, one at Oxford and one at Queen Mary University in London and then there's you know some on the continent as well uh, in the Netherlands and other countries but this is the only one that's available in Ireland. Um, so Essentially, the background to this, to, to our development of this program is that we have always offered um, a course on international refugee law uh, and European uh, refugee law, the common European asylum system, as it's called, um, to our, all our LLM students in the Irish Centre for Human Rights. And those two modules always had a really high uptake. And so we felt that the time had come and international migration and refugee law issues have now become so pressing. Um, and so prevalent on, on the international scene and in terms of policy development and uh, key issues, key legal issues, that we felt the time had come to develop a specialised LLM, you know, looking at, at, at these issues specifically. Um, so we've developed this fairly unique programme, Unique in Ireland, um, to enable students to develop their knowledge of international and regional law policy and practice as it relates to migration, human trafficking and asylum. So I'll just maybe distinguish between those concepts, first of all. So immigration is the process whereby you leave your own country and you go to another country. Um, and it's a multifaceted concept. It can be legal. Um, and indeed, some people at, the, at today's uh, seminar might be um, EU citizens exercising their free movement rights. So that would be an example. And so it can be legal or it can be what we call irregular. So people can migrate for all sorts of reasons, they don't have the, the papers uh, necessary to allow them to migrate legally, and so they migrate irregularly, um, which obviously brings them into confrontation with, with states' prerogatives to control immigration, and that leads to um, a flashpoint between states and irregular migrants. And states resort to all sorts of fairly sharp tactics to control immigration, irregular migration, including prolonged immigration detention, which is a form of administrative detention, but without the due process guarantees that would, would normally associate with the detention in the criminal context, for example. Um, so that's migration. So people migrate legally and people migrate irregularly. Um, human trafficking is the phenomenon whereby people are moved across international borders, um, but it involves some aspect of deception, coercion, um, and they're exploited upon their arrival in their destination country. And indeed, human trafficking can make use of legal migration routes or people can be trafficked in irregularly. Um, and a pressing issue at the moment is, is what to do with victims of human trafficking. In the past, human victims of human trafficking would be, have been treated themselves as having violated immigration law, whereas in fact, they are the victim of, of an offence. So nowadays we ad advocate a human rights approach, but that's just a, a developing area of law. And then there's another branch of, of international law, which is the whole area of refugee law or asylum law. Um, and this is a little bit distinct from other areas of immigration law because it's governed by an important international treaty, which is the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. And this establishes that um, people who are recognized as refugees, people who, in other words, have fled their country of origin because they're in fear of persecution for some aspect because of some aspect of their identity their race or their religion for example they've fled their own country and they're seeking asylum in another country and um, well if they're recognized as refugees they have to be granted a certain number of rights amongst which is the right not to be sent back to their own country 
So it's unlike other areas of immigration law, because in other areas of immigration law, it's largely up to the state how they treat immigrants, whereas within asylum or refugee law, there are certain international obligations that the state has to meet uh, and it has lost its own sovereignty over those areas. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we that we deal with in the LLM and international migration and refugee law and policy. So who might this programme be of interest to? Um, well, looking at the cross section of students that we've had over the past three years, um, I can see that the programme is of interest to people who are already working in the field of immigration or asylum, but um, they don't necessarily have an academic or a legal grounding uh, in the field and they want to, to build their own capacity to be able to acquit their jobs better. Um, for example, the first year of the programme, we had a woman from the Bahamas who was part of the immigration, um, she was an immigration officer in the Bahamas, and at that time, and still I assume in the Bahamas, they were just gearing up to be a country of net immigration, whereas previously they always sent emigrants abroad. Um, and they had just signed the 1951 convention relating to, to the status of refugees. So they were trying to build their capacity to deal with matters of immigration and asylum. And so they sent this immigration officer over to the Irish Centre of Human Rights to take this LLM so that she would be better able to, to do her work. Um, but it's also an attractive option for people who are looking to enter the field uh, of immigration, asylum law, human rights law uh, in, in that area and who want a good grounding uh, or a good academic qualification in the area before entry. Um, and I'll just address a point that's often asked at this stage, which is um, whether as an entry level requirement, you have to have an undergraduate degree in law because this is an LLM after all, in fact, all our, our uh, master's programs are, are LLMs. And the short answer to that is no. Um, about half our students do have a legal background and half don't have a legal background. So a lot of students come from a related field, it could be uh, international relations, it might be politics, it might be sociology, um, it might be some other aspect of the social sciences, um, but they don't necessarily have a legal background. That is not an impediment to doing any of these LLMs because um, we, we start or we pitch our courses at the beginning at least at the entry level now progress is pretty fast so you have to keep up um or you fall behind pretty quickly but that's that's our starting point is the assumption that not everybody has a background in law um okay and also this llm is of interest to people who want to pursue research on the human rights of migrants asylum seekers and refugees so this might be somebody who wishes to pursue a phd and indeed one of our the graduates of the program um is pursuing a phd um uh, she's looking at three countries, um, Spain, uh, Italy and Greece, um, and she's looking at push and pullback operations like I referred to earlier on in the Mediterranean and the extent to which they're consistent with European human rights uh, and refugee law and policy. Um, so she's a graduate of our, of our uh, programme um, and she's also the recipient of an NUI Galway um, Hardyman scholarship. So that's a very prestigious uh, scholarship. Um, that she won um, in order to enable her to do the PhD work. Um, so the programme, just like the LLM in Human Rights, it's a one-year full-time or two-year part-time programme. Um, and I'll speak now about the, the kind of modules that you'll be taking. Um, so we have four core modules that you have to take. So, so it's a bit more structured than the LLM in Human Rights. Um, the core modules that you have to take are contemporary issues in international migration law. So there are issues of uh, regular and irregular migration and human trafficking. Um, then European migration law, which deals with, for example, the free movement of EU citizens. It also deals with EU migration law because this area has been harmonized at the EU level. Um, and then on the other side of the house, remember earlier on, I distinguished between immigration law and refugee law. Well, on the refugee law side of the house, we have a course in international refugee law, um, which looks at that convention that I spoke about, the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. But it also explores the intersection between international refugee law and international human rights law. And then there's a short module called the Common European Asylum System, which looks at the EU uh, common system for processing asylum applications within the EU. 
Um, so they're the four modules and you take two in the first semester. If you're doing it full time, you take two in the first semester and two in the second semester. And then you make up the rest of your credits from the suite of optional modules that are available that Anna mentioned already. So you can see that we have um, a, quite a generous offering of optional modules. Um, so ones that I've noticed that the students on this LLM like to take are things like gender and human rights, international child rights. Some people take international human rights law if they haven't taken human rights law in the past, uh, international criminal law, international humanitarian law, um, transnational lawyering. Um, and some students who don't come from a legal background like to take public international law because that gives them a good grounding. All these are, are modules that relate in some way to public international law. So the broad subject of public international law can give uh, students a good grounding uh, in this. So in terms of careers, um, the type of careers that we envisage following from this type of LLM are not unlike what Anna already talked about, actually. So working with an NGO, a non-governmental organization, specializing in migration or refugee protection, human trafficking or human rights law or policy, uh, working with an intergovernmental organization like the UN um, or the Council of Europe or the EU, for example, um, working for one of the refugee status determination bodies, either in Ireland or in another country. So these are the bodies that actually make the decisions as to whether someone should be recognized as a refugee or not. Uh, working in legal practice in the field as a paralegal or a subject to the necessary qualifications as a solicitor or a barrister. And we have had a few solicitors and barristers who've done, who are already practicing, but really feel that a lot of their practice relates to asylum and migration issues and they come and do the course with us and then they're better equipped to, to take on that casework. Um, or indeed, as I've already mentioned, to be equipped to develop a PhD proposal. Now, in terms of what our graduates have gone on to do, I'm speaking here about, so we only have two years essentially of graduates and you have to remember that those two years were two COVID years. So it's a little bit difficult for me to say with any degree of certainty what our graduates have gone on to do. But when I talk about our graduates doing these things, I'm also referring to graduates of the other LLMs in the Irish Centre for Human Rights that had a special, a special focus on refugee and migration issues. Um, so we've had a number of our graduates go on and work with the UN Refugee Agency, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. We have at least two graduates who've gone on to work with the Refugee Status Determination Body in Dublin, the International Protection Office. Uh, we have a graduate from the first year working for the European Parliament in an, a policy and advocacy role there. Um, we have one, a graduate from the year before last working as an advocacy officer in the Irish Refugee Council. And I've already mentioned that we have a PhD student who has received a Hardy Man scholarship from NUI Galway and is also currently applying to the Irish Research Council for their support as well. Um, so that'll sort of give you a flavour of the types of roles um, that you might be looking to go into uh, as a graduate of the LLM in International Migration and Refugee Law and Policy. So I'll hand back over now to Lisa. Great. Thanks, Kira. Um, we just have two final slides to present before we do a Q&A. Um, I would like to briefly talk to you about how to make an application and about scholarships available. So first of all, with regards to making an application, you can make an application online at nuigalway.ie forward slash apply. And the entry requirements for the LLM programmes in the Irish Centre for Human Rights are as follows. Um, the centre welcomes applications from graduates in a range of disciplines, including law, political science, social science and humanity. So you don't necessarily have to have um, a law degree. In cases where applicants come from a non-law background, the Irish Centre for Human Rights will consider academic background, relevant work experience, references and a personal statement as to why you would like to pursue the course. Applicants must normally have a change, a primary degree with at least a two on grade. However, those falling short of this standard may be considered where they can demonstrate other academic accomplishments and um, relevant work experience. With regards to um, closing date for applications, applications are now open. Offers are issued on a continuous basis. So once you apply, you normally receive an answer within a few working days as to whether or not you have been accepted onto the programme. 
So because there's no official closing date, we basically um, continue to offer places until the programmes are full. We encourage candidates to apply as early as possible. And finally, I would like to briefly mention some of our scholarships. So NUI Galway offers taught postgraduate scholarships for EU students. They're worth 1,500 euro, and they are for students who have been accepted into a full-time programme and who have achieved a first-class honours in their level eight degree. We also have University of Sanctuary scholarships for immigrants, asylum seekers, refugees and ethnic minorities. And if you search um, University of Sanctuary scholarships, you'll be able to find more details about that. And then we also have lots of international scholarships. Last year, we had merit-based scholarships worth 2,000 euro. We had country Pacific scholarships. Um, some of them were worth 4,000 euro, while others were worth 2,000 euro. There's also the Government of Ireland scholarships. Last year, the Government of Ireland um, gave 60 scholarships across all Irish universities. They covered full fees as well as um, expenses of 10,000 euro. And in the Irish Centre for Human Rights, we've also had um, many students come in on the Irish Aid Fellowship Training Programme. And you can find out more information about these scholarships at nuigalways.ie forward slash postgraduate underscore scholarships. Now, the um, closing date for all these scholarships is quite varied, but a lot of them would close before March next year. So I would have a look at the website and note those closing dates. And finally, before we start our Q&A, um, if you have any questions after today, you can email humanrights at nuigalways.ie and you can keep up to date with what is happening in the centre on our Facebook or Twitter page. So I'll stop sharing my slides now. And if you have any questions, um, please pop them into the chat and we'll get to them shortly. Or else please um, raise your hand and once we get to you, you can turn on your microphone and ask a question. But before I start um, answering your questions, I'd like to very quickly um, introduce a current student and a graduate of ours. So first, um, if I could introduce um, Emily Williams, She's a current student of our LLM in International Human Rights. And um, Emily, if you wouldn't mind maybe turning on your microphone, um, I suppose, first of all, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and why you have decided to um, study the LLM in International Human Rights. Sure. Um, thanks, Lisa. So hi, everyone. My name is Emily. Uh, I'm from Canada and I'm one of the non-legal background students. So I have a Bachelor of Arts in Criminology and Human Rights. So during this degree, I was exposed to the international human rights law system, and I was really intrigued by its possibilities for activism, like Anna mentioned earlier in this presentation. So that was my primary motivation for applying to this LLM program, as I was able to do it coming from a non-law background, and um, this opportunity wasn't available to me in Canada. Um, I also am really interested in just the human rights system in general and learning about how it works on the domestic level, and I could achieve that here, and the wide range of modules that I could study was also a key feature for me, because I'm very much the type of person who doesn't want to be like um, nailed down to just one specific thing, so the variety of different electives I could take was very attractive. Great, um, thanks Emily, and I know you're only in the, the program a short while, but um, what have you been enjoying most about the program? Uh, for me, I've mostly been enjoying the experiential learning opportunities. So as was mentioned, I'm one of the students doing the International Human Rights Law Legal Clinic, and I have the opportunity to be researching and working on a project regarding Ireland's institutional abuses. So this has been a really great way for me to learn more about Ireland's history and human rights abuses and apply the knowledge I've been learning in class to a issue that is still prevalent today. Great, thanks. Emily, and I, I know you're still at the early stages of your LLM programme, but um, do you have any specific career goals at the moment of what you might like to do afterwards? 
Uh, right now, I'm thinking about pursuing some type of policy or adv advocacy work, either at a governmental level or with an NGO. I come from a civil servant background, so I was involved in drafting of legislation and policies, and I saw sort of the disconnect between uh, countries' obligations under international human rights law and how they may or may not have been implemented. So that is where I would like to focus eventually. That's great. Thank thanks, um, Emily. And uh, finally, for those um, watching who have never been to Galway, um, can you tell us a little bit what it's like to move from Canada to Galway City? Galway is great. I often say it's the perfect size because you're never more than a 20 minute walk from anywhere. The university is fairly centrally located. So it's not one of those cities where you have to be super concerned about living right next to the university. Um, it's very easily accessible. One thing I will warn people about is obviously the weather. Uh, coming from Canada, it's kind of a nice change because there's a lot less snow, obviously, and it's just rain, but the rain is a bit different. Uh, sometimes it will be sunny and it will just start raining and you think, oh, it's sunny, it's not going to rain, but it will continue raining for a few minutes or so. So just make sure you bring a waterproof jacket everywhere you go and layer up and you'll be fine. Great, thanks. Emily, and um, if anyone has any specific questions for Emily, um, please pop them in the chat or if you have questions for any of our programme directors. Um, Elisa, if I could talk um, to you for a few moments, that would be great. Um, Elisa, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you completed the LLM in International Migration and Refugee Law and Policy last year. Yes, hi everyone. So I'm Elisa, I'm from Belgium and I'm one of the students who had a law background. Um, and I can say from, from the students who were there last year that we all had different challenges to overcome. So it, it wasn't necessarily um, that much uh, harder for the ones without a law background. So I would encourage if you don't have a law background not to be afraid to do the LLM. Um, so, I, so as I said, I have a law background and before doing this, I worked in international criminal law. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to do an internship with the UNHCR in uh, Ecuador, working with Venezuelan Colombian refugees. And when I did that, I realized that that was really what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I really loved it so much, but I hadn't had much of a, a background in refugee law and migration law. So I didn't know um, all of the legal aspects that I really wanted to know. So after a few years, I, I thought about it. And uh, when the pandemic started, I thought about it a lot and I decided that I wanted to do uh, another LLM in, um, in migration refugee law. And so that's how I came to be here. That, that's great. And um, what would you say were the, I suppose, top two highlights for you while studying in the Irish Centre for Human Rights? Uh, top two, um, well, Definitely the opportunities, uh, aside from the, the modules, um, the fact that we had the mood court, the, I participated in the ICC mood court as an assistant coach, um, which was really exciting and a new experience for me. Um, and then I also participated in the Global Legal Action Network placement. I didn't do the clinic, but from what I heard from the students who did, it was an amazing opportunity. Uh, and what I did with Glenn was really exciting. Um, and I learned a lot, uh, you know, the master's is very academic and then you also get to have these practical experiences that really give you a, a great overview of, uh, of how it is to work in human rights. Um, and my second favorite part, I'd have to say the fact that the exams where you have to write essays, um, I believe that's most years not just to, because we were in the COVID year. Um, and the essays that you get to write are, you get to choose your topic. So you really choose something that you have a vested interest in and you get to dive very deep into a subject. Um, and that is so, in my opinion, it's just a great experience. It was so valuable because when you have written exams, you tend to stuff information in your head and not necessarily retain everything. Whereas here you really get to learn about the depth of specific topics that you might be interested in, which also can be very useful when you're applying for jobs. Um, you can show that you are a little bit specialized in certain areas uh, and maybe you choose even quite coherent topics uh, throughout, the, throughout the program. So I definitely enjoyed that a lot. Great. And um, 
what projects did you get the opportunity to work on with Glenn? We worked on um, a project in, in Colombia uh, and Ireland, so international litigation concerning uh, mining activities, um, where the mining activities had uh, severely impacted the health and livelihood and rights of uh, indigenous communities in a certain area. Um, but what we were looking at, well, I specifically looked at the Colombian aspect of it. So what are the Colombian laws relating to mining, to indigenous rights, uh, to uh, health law? Um, because I speak Spanish, so I, I focused on that, whereas the other person on the team focused on the Irish side of things, um, looking uh, at wh whether the crimes under Colombian law could constitute an offense under Irish law. Uh, to hold uh, Irish companies or Irish based companies accountable for um, the, the profit that they make off of the um, activities of the mining companies in Colombia. So it was very complex, very interesting, very new for me, but uh, I learned a lot. Great. Th thanks, Elisa. And I suppose finally, um, what are, I, I know you're only a, a recent graduate, but what are your career goals for the future? Well, currently I'm working uh, for consultancies for the UN on uh, women's rights in various countries. Um, so that's very interesting, but my career aspirations are definitely to work with refugees, um, ideally starting in the field. It could be with the UNHCR or NGOs, um, but I would definitely want to go in the field at first and later on work at a policy level, uh, either at the EU or at the UNHCR, but I would prefer to start in the field so that you can really speak to the people who need protection who or resettlement. So protection and resettlement are different aspects of uh, refugee law. Um, and I'm interested in both. And, uh, and essentially that's what I want to do. That's great. Thanks, Elisa. And I see we have um, some questions coming in on the chat um, the first one being about the um, the grade requirements for Germany and we actually have a web page about that so I'm going to very quickly um, grab the link of the web page and I will pop it in the chat now the chat in a moment um, one moment So for that student from Germany, I've just popped the link in the chat to um, so that you know what a 2-1 is in terms of um, an undergrad degree from Germany. So you'll see that there, there's a table there with the conversion marks. And moving on then to the next questions. Um, Sorry, Lisa, can I just come in on the question of the 2-1, uh, if yeah. that's okay? Um, so just to say that um, we will look at, at the application in the round anyway. So even if somebody doesn't have a 2-1, if they have slightly below a 2-1, we'll take um, into consideration whether they have any relevant work experience, for example, or you know, we take into consideration why it is that they're motivated to do the course. So we look at the entire application in the round. It's not just about academic qualifications. Yeah, that, that's perfect. And I, I'm just on the German webpage now, and I see that um, a 2-1 in a German degree would be... Um, level two which is um can, which is called gut um good in germany but you can see that there on the link i sent and here i see you already answered the second question on the number of places every year um so we'll wait another couple of moments in case any other questions come in but if you would like to turn on your microphone um please do um, we're happy to an answer any questions that you may have I'm sorry, I was the one asking um, how many applicants are there actually in that places. So thank you for much for all the input today. But I was wondering how many applicants are there for the general international humanitarian law master? Um, hi, um, uh, thanks for your question, Gina. Um, that is a good question. Because I've just started in September, um, I actually wasn't involved in the intake, um, the intake of applications. Um, 
my understanding, I think it's around uh, around 60. Um, and um, to be honest, so the conversation that I had with the um, admin person that was in charge of the applicants is that an, an awful lot have to be um, rejected simply because they're not complete. <laughs> so um, if you're filling out an application, make sure to complete all the information required and um, put everything in there. But um, that's my understanding. But um, I would say if you would like the um, specific numbers, um, I, the best thing would probably be to email our admin team, um, which I, I'll, I'll pop that email for the admin team into the, um, into the uh, message box here. And I think they'll be able to send you on the specific numbers. Thank you so much. Oh, I might just add, um, Gina, that just to what Anna said there, um, the LLM and International Human Rights would be our flagship LLM. It's our biggest um, program. So it would attract a large number uh, of applicants every year. And then our other programs, whether it's the LLM and International Migration and Refugee Law and Policy or International Criminal Law, or humanitarian law and peace support operations. These are all much smaller programs. Um, but in effect, and, and maybe Emily or Elisa can speak to this, in effect, all students in the center end up sort of uh, in different classes with each other. So although you're doing a specific program, in the end, it doesn't really make that much difference. Uh, that's my view. I don't know, Emily or Elisa, would you disagree with me there? No, I, I completely agree with you because I've met people from all of the different LLMs in the center and different classes. And me, for example, my degree has sort of turned out to be half international human rights and half migration and refugee law and policy because I'll be taking, I, I took the contemporary issues in international migration law this semester, and then I'll be in international refugee law next semester paired with the international human rights modules. So it is very easy to sort of pick the LLM that suits your interests the most broadly. And then once you're here to really tailor it to what you wanna use it for. Great. Thanks. And I see another question on scholarships with regards to documents that you require for them. So each scholarship is very different. For example, um, some of the university scholarships, in order to apply for them, you have to um, write a 500 word personal statement, while other application processes for scholarships are completely different. But I will share the link to um, scholarships in the chat. Um, however, note that the details on this page refer to last year's scholarships. Um, this web page will be updated soon with scholarships for next year, but the scholarships won't change too much from year to year. So you can have a look at that just to get a sense of what you might need for an application. I don't see any other questions coming in, so we might just leave it there unless one appears in the next couple of moments but thanks everyone for joining today and I'd like to say special thanks to Elisa and Emily who have given up their time today to talk about their student experience and um, Anna already um, shared the link to human rights at nuigalway.ie so if any questions feel free to email the team there so thanks everyone and um, if anyone wants to turn on their microphones and say goodbye please do Thank you so much for everything. Goodbye. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.